At this time, I'd like to invite Maria Rosario Gala to uh, do our opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Rosario Gala. I am one of the members, board members of the Hispanic Heritage Council. I am also the assistant principal of School 3. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and I've lived here in Western New York for many, many years. On behalf of the Hispanic Heritage Council of Western New York and the board of directors, I would like to welcome everyone to this beautiful breakfast and this beautiful day. We hope that you have an amazing time with us this morning and that you enjoy your breakfast. And thank you for being participants once more in this beautiful breakfast that we offer every year. This is our fourth year with, uh, with us providing this breakfast and us sharing together. Thank you for being here for us. Enjoy the breakfast and have a great day. One of our wonderful students in the Buffalo Public Schools. By the way, I'm a Buffalo Public School I'm administrator. I'm the art director of uh, Buffalo Public Schools. So I'm really excited when we get to show off our kids. Um, he's a student at Frederick Law Olmsted School 64, and he's enrolled in the dual language program. And I'd like to invite Matthew Valdivia to um, do the Pledge of Allegiance for us this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo el poder de Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. against our brothers and sisters in Orlando. I would ask that you turn to page eight in your program, and I'd like to share that passage with you to express our feelings. The Hispanic Heritage Council of Western New York Incorporated remembers the victims of the tragic events that occurred in Orlando, Florida on Sunday, June 12, 2016. Our, our hearts and minds are with the families, 
friends, and community of the deceased and injured. We condemn violence in any form and recognize the need to come together as communities and as a nation to combat hatred and promote peace, love, and acceptance. If you could join me in a minute of silence in remembrance of those lost in Orlando, Florida. Yeah. At this juncture, I'd like to invite Reverend Daniel Nieves, who will do our invocation. He's the senior pastor of Destiny International Church. Thank you, Reverend. Good morning, everyone. I won't ask you to stand again, <laughs> but if you could just bow your heads right where you are, that'll be just fine. Let's just go before the Lord in prayer and dedicate this day. Father, we thank you for the gathering of friends and family this morning. And we thank you for times like these that we're able to gather together and share in simple food and drink, just times of relaxation. We ask that you would bless this meal and all that this meal means to us. And may this food nourish us, and may the fellowship enrich us in our lives. And most of all, we invite you into our homes and into this moment, that your presence may be felt, enjoying and laughter. May the camaraderie and fellowship be nourishing into our lives as we proceed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me say that, are there members of the Hispanic American Veterans Memorial here? Is the president here, Angelo Otero, or the vice president, Felicia Cruz? Yes, Please come forward. <laughs> Benny, you're a member. Can you please come up, please? Any other members, please come up. And while they're making their way up, let me say a few words. I don't deny my age. I'm 61 years old. I'm very proud of it. In the month of April, I was hosted at the U.S. Capitol by our Congressman Brian Higgins for the unveiling of the Congressional Gold Medal of the Voting Canadians. For me, it was the most moving experience I ever had in my life to see the honor of our veterans, both here and those that passed, those that are still missing in action, they were all part of the Korean War. And I know that there's many in the audience here that have a parent that was part of that 65th Infantry. Cheeto, your dad was part of that 65th Infantry Regiment. And there's others. This past Saturday at the Hispanic American Veterans Memorial Anniversary, we had a dedication to the 65th Infantry Regiment. Those veterans that were there, that are still alive, and those that were deceased, that their family members were there, they were honored for their valor, for their courage, for their service. We owe a debt of gratitude to those veterans and all the veterans that served in all wars. Let me call our congressman up, and on behalf, congressman, of our community, our nation, our Hispanic community, the Hispanic American Veterans Memorial Committee, the Hispanic Heritage Council, and on behalf of the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor Ceremonial Committee, our chairman, national chairman, 
Sam Rodriguez that sends his regards. We'd like to present you a token of appreciation for being one of the first congressmen in New York State to co-sponsor H.R. 1726 that awarded the Congressional Gold Medal to our voting Kinneers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Kaz. And I was thinking when Kaz came to the United States Capitol to be part of a delegation to receive the Congressional Gold Medal, the highest civilian award given by Congress, we watched the faces of the Hispanic Americans that were there. He felt proud to be an American to see that this extraordinary group of individuals with great dedication, great courage, who had really been denied access by their own government, yet they go in bravely and fight the wars to defend this great nation. There are 55 million Hispanic Americans in this country. We are a greater country when we embrace our diversity. We often hear some of the churlish uh, rhetoric about immigration and about, you know, rounding people up, throwing people out. Anytime anybody's critical of it, the wall continues to get higher. If they had their way, this room would be empty, including this podium. The United States takes in more immigrants legally than every country in the world combined. We are the great aspiration of the world. We export our freedoms, we export our principles. Our founding documents are full of language that says to fulfill the great promise of America, we must embrace the diversity that has made America great. It is a great time to be in this country. It's also a time of reflection. We should not seek to condemn others or judge others. We should look within ourselves when you look at the gun violence that occurred, the, the, the demonstrations on the floor of the House of Representatives this past week, our efforts were just to call out the fact that democracy in the nation's capital, in the United States of America, on the floor of the United States House of Representatives was being denied. And you think about it. You think about Orlando, 49 people dead, 53 people wounded, one shooter, a terrorist. He should not have access to a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> you look at Newtown. You look at Newtown. 20 children slaughtered. Six adults who were throwing themselves in front of the kids to protect them from one shooter with a weapon of mass destruction. The framers of the Constitution never could have anticipated this kind of hell. We should be able to, we should be able to allow those who are responsible gun owners to fully, fully exercise their Second Amendment rights. But people who we don't allow on airplanes shouldn't be able to legally purchase semi-automatic weapons that are designed to do one thing. There's one thing that advances more quickly in our society from the technology of killing. Every day, weapons of mass destruction are being manufactured that are designed to kill more people as quickly as possible. That has to end, and we can advance common sense gun safety legislation because both Republicans and Democrats support that as well as 90% of the American population. But this is a day of celebration, to celebrate the Hispanic heritage of our great city and our great nation. So we give thanks for many things. I give thanks to you for the extraordinary opportunity that you give me to represent this community 
in the United States Congress. We give thanks to this Hispanic heritage, to Kaz Rodriguez, my friend, for the good work that he has done and for the good work that he will continue to do, only for the people in the community that he loves. And finally, we give thanks to a good and generous nation, a good and generous nation and a God that makes this day and all of our days possible. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let me uh, just let the president of the Hispanic American Veterans Memorial say a few words. Thank you, Kaz. I appreciate that. And I say uh, from the bottom of my heart, viva la raza. You know, I'm going to try and augment uh, what the congressman eloquently said up here. You know, and we got a lot of people that bring in all kinds of reasoning and all kinds of excuses and all kinds of uh, specialists to, uh, to make laws to protect us from people with guns. And I think that the only thing that I would have to offer to that is that the biggest weapon that we have as a nation, as people, as an individual, is vigilance. That's it, vigilance. If you see something, Report it, because that's what's going to help stop all this. We can continue to make laws and, and say bad things and rhetoric about people, but we all have a responsibility to watch out what's going on in our neighborhoods, in our yards, and by the way, in our own families. Okay, So keep that in mind, vigilance. I want to thank everybody. I spent 26 years in the military. And that was my first trip to Washington, D.C. with uh, my friend Kaz. By the way, I've known Kaz since he was five. So watch out. And I, uh, I share Kaz's sentiments about that. I was never more proud. Um, I, I, I just can't know what to say. But I will tell you this, and I said this at our ceremony for our, our memorial. If you get by, if you get a chance and you go by, stop and look at that memorial. It has two things that makes me so very, very proud of. And one, that it is the Western New York Hispanic Veterans Memorial. And as I walked around the grounds of the cemetery out there in Washington, Arlington, for those of you that know, know the name of it, our monument could take its place among all of those beautiful monuments that they have out there. And I say that sincerely, sincerely. So, muchísimas gracias. I'm glad that I'm here. I want to thank Kaz and all his people. Now, by the way, I want to say hello to one Borinquen here who's known me since I was two. Where's Señor Negrón? Are you here? He's not here? Well, God bless you anyway. But thank you very much. I hope I didn't steal too much of your time. God bless you all. Thank you very much. And we'll continue the program. Michelle. So at this point, I'd like to ask um, our awards will be um, presented. We would like to ask for um, John Starkey to please come up. Um, is Angelo here? Okay, so if you could come up just to mention a little bit about Angelo. John Starkey, um, future principal at our Lafayette High School. Hey, good morning. Um, it's great to be here. I'm the new principal for Lafayette International High School. We're going to be opening up our doors in September of uh, 2016. And here to my left, uh, thank you, thank you. Here to my left is Angelo Chemelis, and he just graduated from Lafayette a couple of days ago. <laughs> And when we started this planning year for the new school, we were really focused on the, the population of English language learners and, of course, the population that's been here for a long time and really needs a lot of support are our young Hispanic students and mainly Puerto Rican students, but there are others, Cubans, Dominicans, but mainly Puerto Rican. And uh, Cass and I started working with each other when David Mauricio in, uh, introduced us and um, very quickly it became evident that this relationship was very important between the community and the school in order to further support our Hispanic students. And we had the timeline, the historic timeline, transported to Lafayette. 
And we brought all of the students up there, and they really liked it. Some of the kids said, oh, I've been there. Oh, that looks familiar. But Angelo said, you know, I love it. I really like it because I'm pretty new here to Buffalo from Puerto Rico. But it seems like there could be something more about the young people of today. So that led to a relationship that we formed between Just Buffalo Writing Center and Robin Jordan from Just Buffalo is here and they were able to secure a grant and she became a writing tutor for Angelo. And almost single-handedly, Angelo went out into the community, interviewed people like um, Diego from Buffalo Push. I know Diego's here and he was a big part of the project. Uh, Lucy from the Bell Center and and many other people. So this whole project... um, was was made possible by the support of the Hispanic Heritage Council and a lot of you here in the room. And it really, I think, is a good symbol of what we um, are expecting of the new um, Lafayette and the new um, Spanish bilingual program that we're going to um, be starting in the fall and hopefully will be very successful for generations to come. So I think the real star of the show here is Angel also. He's going to say a few words to you in Spanish and I will um, interpret for him. And then we will unveil the uh, newest panel of the um, Western New York Hispanic Heritage Timeline that Angelo has created so you can all uh, admire it and it will become a part of the exhibit um, for generations to come so they can learn about the experiences of Hispanic community here in Buffalo. Um, thank you for, um, for For your attention, um, I speak um, Spanish. Um, sorry for <laughs> no speaking English, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> eh, esto es el panel que he creado. Es una pequeña obra eh, sobre sobre nuestra generación, en nuestra cultura actual, eh, para demostrarle a la comunidad de Buffalo y y el mundo entero de que todavía se puede eh, demostrar que, que hay un progreso en nuestra cultura y entre nuestra nación eh, y que con un poco de, de ejemplo se puede um, llegar a, a muchas cosas y demostrar que, que eh, um, todavía hay, hay que dar para, para esta cultura llamada pues eh, puertorriqueña por los puertorriqueños Eh, es un, una gran obra que pude crear eh, espero que de verdad le guste y ahí estamos gracias okay. so, thank you for this honor this was a project that I did to be able to show that the young Puerto Rican generation can contribute to everything that's happening in Buffalo. It's an honor to have done this for this generation and future generations and the progress of our community. And so now we'd like to show you the panel that Angelo created. As you know, the Hispanic Heritage Council's mission is to foster and inspire awareness and understanding of past, present, and future contributions of the Hispanic community in Western New York. M&T has been a big partner with us, a great sponsor. They have helped uh, donate the audio equipment we are using to document our efforts. Their contributions helped us purchase it, this equipment. Um, this is the equipment we've used to compile the history and put it in digital format. The History Project is going to be housed at the Buffalo Niagara Library and on our web. It is a digital archive of photos and audio, and it's a first of its kind locally, and it's been praised nationally. So I'd like to call up Brad Dossinger, 
Vice President of M&T to present a token of appreciation from the council. Thank you very much, MT. Good morning. Good morning. I want to call your attention in your program to page 10. Page 10 in your program announces something that we're very proud of at the Hispanic Heritage Council. Um, we uh, Last fall, held an event at El Mambadillo School 76 to commemorate the birthplace of bilingual education in the city of Buffalo. And the Buffalo schools are in dire need of bilingual teachers and teachers who are prepared to work with ELLs and in all the different uh, educational um, domains of the, of the district. And in an uh, effort to improve the graduation rate, increase the rate of Latinos becoming teachers and bilingual teachers especially, we were proud to establish at that event the Ralph R. Hernandez Bilingual Education Scholarship. On page 10 of your program, it announces all of the criteria and the, they're also posted on our website. And um, we wanted to make you aware of that and help us to spread the word because we will be accepting applications immediately for that uh, scholarship. Uh, so uh, thank you I, and I want to um, present the Nora who's going to thank our wonderful sponsor of that scholarship. Uh, so we brought this idea to this uh, manner for this scholarship and thanks to his support to not only our community and the education of Buffalo and Hispanic Heritage Council, within a few days we got a yes and we were able to bring this scholarship to our community. So we would like to thank our friend and supporter, Gary Crosby, who's president and CEO of First Niagara. everybody thank you so much for coming <sighs> anyway today we want to um, give thanks to um, one of our founding um, members um, Gilbert Hernandez um, he was a former board of directors from 2011 to 2015 um, with gratitude we had this for you Gilbert where are you I don't see you <laughs> He was very instrumental in our bylaws and um, and a lot of the activities that we've done here in the um, community. And I also like to thank um, Evelyn Santiago Rosario. Evelyn. <laughs> Evelyn, can you come over here, please? She's also one of our um, former board directors, and um, we appreciate your devotion and um, your service for our um, Hispanic heritage. Good morning again. <laughs> Uh, I'm really very happy to be standing here at this moment. It's a very special day for me to be here at this breakfast with um, all of you wonderful supporters from the community, from business, from all parts of uh, Buffalo and Western New York who are supporters of, of Hispanic heritage. And it's a special day for me because I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing my brother, Juan Alsace, Consul General of the United States in Toronto, Canada. And if you turn to page five in your booklet, you'll be able to read his biography and all of his accomplishments, which are lengthy. I'm not going to read them to you. You'll have, you'll have the pleasure of reading them <laughs> yourself. But some of the things that it doesn't say in there uh, about my brother Juan, um, that he loved comic books as a boy. He loved to read, and he, he's, a, he's an expert on the Civil War. He loves... Uh, 
Kaufman's pound cake. <laughs> Ask him about the, his business. <laughs> and he loves football and he loves beef on whack, actually. That's part of his uh, email address. He loves to travel, and, he, and because of his work in the Foreign Service, I've been able to travel to some wonderful places. He's had some, the pleasure of being stationed at places like Istanbul, Turkey, and Barcelona, Spain, and I've been able to travel thanks to, to visit him in those wonderful places. Uh, but he's also uh, have been in some hardship places that were dangerous, and um, he served our country in Karachi, Pakistan. And not all that long ago, he spent an entire year in a mobile housing unit south of Baghdad in Iraq and put his life in danger to try to build relations with Iraqis on behalf of our nation. And Foreign Service um, officers work all over the world on behalf of the United States and often don't get a lot of recognition. And so I'm really proud to have a Foreign Service officer as part of our family. And, uh, and I know that one of Juan's greatest wishes is to encourage young people to consider Foreign Service as a career and to learn about more about how they can do that. And we'd love to see um, more Latinos youngsters uh, pursuing Foreign Service as a career. It's really rewarding and of a great benefit to our country. Juan is also a wonderful son to my parents. Uh, my father Juan deceased and my mother who's here, Ramona. He's a wonderful father to my niece and nephew, Renee and John, who weren't able to be here. Uh, he did our family the, a great favor by marrying our wonderful sister, Nancy Happel Alsace, and she's here with him. He's a fantastic brother to me and my brother, Ralph, and to, to my sister, who also is long deceased, but um, who we remember. And, uh, and a wonderful uncle to my children and my brother's children. So a family man, a statesman, and just an all-around wonderful guy. I'm proud to announce my brother Juan Alsace. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a great day to be in Buffalo. And, then, and listening to my sister there, we didn't have that kind of thing when we were young. There was a few things that we might have said to each other. So for her to be saying all those wonderful things about me is, is just wonderful. And, and thank you so much, Tammy. It's, uh, it really is an honor and a privilege. And, and thank you, Kaz, for, for the invitation. It's, uh, it really is an honor for, for a Buffalonian of long standing. It really is an honor to be your keynote speaker uh, today at the 4th Hispanic Heritage Council's annual community breakfast. I feel privileged to speak to fellow citizens who, like me, are from Western New York and of Hispanic heritage. As a diplomat, I normally speak abroad several times a year, presenting United States government policies, touting American values, and encouraging partnership and collaboration in trade, commerce, culture, and counselor services. So it's a real pleasure for me today, particularly, to step outside those lanes, which my normal lanes, and be with you today in my country on topics that I don't typically address abroad. As I was drafting my remarks earlier this week, I thought for a moment that perhaps I should deliver them in Castellano. But then I thought back to my youth here in Buffalo and a story that my family still likes to rid me about. When I was about 16, we were driving up Main Street. It was in the middle of an election campaign. I saw a sign that I proudly translated for my family from English to Spanish. Sedita es un bueno mayor. I don't think that even qualifies as Spanglish. <laughs> but it does point to an underlying message about people who are first generation Americans, as I am, and assimilation and immigration into America. And that's the principal theme that I want to address and discuss this morning, both from my personal experience growing up in Buffalo and also in a larger context. Now, my Castellano is, in fact, a little bit better now than it was 40 years ago thanks to my diplomatic postings in Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, Spain, and Chile, amongst others. But I will continue in English, if for no other reason, that my mom and my sister are still correcting my Spanish. <laughs> and they're sitting there in the front row, uh, Doña Ramona Alsace and my sister, Doctora Tamara Alsace. And I'm so... I always do this to myself. <laughs> And I'm so proud to be speaking here in front of them. Also present is my wife, Nancy, of 36 years, 
My brother Rafael wanted to be here, but he's working in Ohio. And my dad, Juan Arturo, died a little over two years ago, and I sure wish you were here to see this. Along with my sister, Maya. I I'm almost like, sometimes I'm, I think sometimes I'm almost like John Boehner, you know? Um, she was a lawyer, she was brilliant, uh, dedicated to serving those less fortunate, and I wish she was here. Okay, that is, I almost find this sort of a fantastical aspect to me by being here with you today, even more so than when I spoke a couple of months ago at the Buffalo Club. That event seemed more official. I talked about visas and business opportunities and, and policy issues, and this feels more like home, like family, a son come home to the city that helped define him. In the 10 months that I've been in Toronto, I've often run across reminders of my youth. Uh, when I was up in Niagara Falls on uh, Niagara on the Lake at a conference recently, I heard WKVW on the TV. Thought, you know, Herb Weinstein, long gone. <laughs> Radio, hearing commercial commercials for Transit Town Dodge, seeing again sort of the regular coverage of my beloved, but still losing, Bills and Sabres. <laughs> it's really hard to be a Bills fan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I, when I was in Pakistan, the, uh, uh, it was 1990, and I, and I was in, you know, we, back then before the internet, before it, I was sitting there, it's a 12 hour time difference, and I'm sitting there waiting to hear the news about the bills, and then to hear that 20 to 19 loss, and, it, and you know, uh, wide, wide right, it's just been hard. It's been hard. <laughs> but I've also had a chance lately to reacquaint with old friends from, my, from the high school I went up to in Niagara Falls. So for me, it's kind of a time warp, you know, for a working class Buffalo kid who grew up on the west side and then the north side, finds himself in a position he could not have imagined then, United States Council General in Toronto, you know, one of the world's great cities. It reflects, I believe, on the promise of a nation built on an ideal. And that ideal is founded on immigration and the process of becoming an American. It is an issue of some political sensitivity today, and I will stay away from that aspect of it, as indeed I must as a federal worker, and also to keep my job. <laughs> but I can talk about what immigration meant for me, because my family is a pretty good example of how it should work. My mother and father arrived from the, in the United States from the Dominican Republic in 1954, like millions before and millions after, in search of a better life for themselves and their children. My mom had to come first, leaving behind her baby daughter, and you know how hard that would have been for a Latina mom. And then my dad a year later, after a couple of years in New York City, they came to Buffalo early in 1958 on the promise of finding work. My mom's brother, my uncle, had come to Buffalo and said, hey, come here, there's work. And so, while neither of them spoke much English, and they thought, and though they were very well read, poetry was always recited by my father and my mother to us when we were kids. They didn't have much of a formal education. So with a growing family, my dad took jobs as laborers, eventually settling in at Kaufman's Bakery, where he worked for nearly 30 years, rising to head foreman. And when I say worked, I mean worked. I still remember him showing me in, the, in, a, in, a, in a July one of his pay stubs. He put in 100 hours that week, the work of two and a half men. And he, should, and he would relate stories to me sometimes of standing at a bus stop in the dead of a Buffalo winter, and this guy was a Dimin Dominican dandy, um, at 2 a.m. in order to get to work to feed his family. My mom was at home with four kids, sometimes working a part-time or even a full-time job to supplement the family income. Hardworking the definition of the American immigrant experience. It was a working class life uh, with all the challenges that entails. We moved around a lot during my growing up years in search of the right price flat in whatever neighborhood uh, offered the better public school. But there was always food on the table, a roof over our head, and clothes on our back. And always, always, there was this message from both my parents. Go to class, study, read, get good grades. Because even if life circumstances hadn't provided them with the opportunity to get a degree, they knew that education was the next step in the process of becoming an American. And we did. My older sister was a genius, certified. Uh, Phi Beta Kappa, who graduated from New York University's law school. And though her life was cut short, she was truly an American success story. My sister Tammy has her PhD, and her accomplishments as an educator in this city I don't have to repeat to this crowd. My brother has a solid position with a major corporation, and I've done okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
We all accomplished this in the city of Buffalo, a city that when my parents arrived had very few Latinos. There were some Puerto Ricans and Cubans, but pretty much the only other Dominicans were the Perez family. And Tom is now the Secretary of Labor, so I guess you can say we Dominicans did pretty well. <laughs> the, Latino, the, the Latino community was concentrated on the west side, and I remember going to the Puerto Rican club with my parents, basically to watch them dance the merengue, a skill I never mastered. <laughs> Which leads me to the last point on becoming an American. It's a process of assimilation, especially for us who are first generation Americans. It is not that we forget uh, the old ways or the culture of our parents, but we seek to fit in, wanting to be like the Americans around us, learning English, some of us forgetting our Spanish, proving that we have succeeded because of individual drive, talent, and ambition. It's the American way. You know, when Kaz sent me this invitation to, to address you here, uh, I was a bit amused because he suggested I'd given so much back to the community. So I'm not a member of any Hispanic organization such as this, and actually I never particularly embraced my Hispanic heritage when I was growing up, nor did I deny it. Uh, at age 16, I insisted on being called Juan rather than John. But I guess I always thought that none of that really that mattered that much, you know, to my success. And of course, in my youthful pride, I was wrong because my success was built on the backs of Latinos who had gone before, like my mother and father, and many others, some of whom I will talk about this morning. But that said, I think I've represented well that Hispanics are no different from other ethnic groups that have come to American shores. Work hard, get an education, be an American. As a diplomat, I represent the United States as an American, and that's enough, I find. That said, there's no question that Americans of Hispanic descent have been, can contributed to the success of this country. We are a key stitch in the American fabric. Here in Buffalo, that part of Niagara Street from Porter Avenue, Peace Bridge, to Niagara Square City Hall is called Avenida San Juan. And the surrounding area was designated the Hispanic Heritage District by the Buffalo Common Council in 2012. The flag of Puerto Rico is raised in front of City Hall each year, preceding the Puerto Rican and Hispanic Day Parade. This year, the 47th annual uh, Grease Pole Festival will be celebrated at the Olivencia Center on Swan Street. The Grease Pole Festival, El Palo en Sabao, is Buffalo's longest running ethnic festival. And I remember going to the center uh, with friends of the family, Cubans who had actually fled the Castro regime to watch the, to watch the dancing. Buffalo has a thriving bilingual education program, in no part thanks to my sister Tammy, and last fall celebrated the birthplace of bilingual education in Buffalo at Herman Badillo Bilingual Academy. Academy. We have here, here an icon of Buffalo society, uh, Juan Taxidor, Indio, to his family and friends. And, and his program, Ecos Borincanos, was a listening staple in our home and in the homes I imagine many of you here as well. We have a Hispanic Veterans Memorial, the first to feature a female soldier. And this year, as Congressman Higgins talked, about the 65th Infantry, the Bolinquineers, were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, and many of them still live here in Western New York. And so that's sort of some of the local stuff, but it, you know, there's also some national issues here that I just want to just briefly touch on. Immigration from Latin America and the growth of the nation's Hispanic population are two of the most important recent developments in the history of the United States. The Hispanic population has grown from a small and regionally concentrated population of fewer than 6 million in 1960 a little over just 3% of the U.S. population, to a now widely dispersed population of more than 50 million, or 17% of the nation's population. Hispanics or Latinos are a diverse group tied together with a colonial history, language, and social perception that face similar societal challenges associated with their identity. From violence of revolution to dictatorship, yet every wave of Latin Americans has added a layer of diversity to the country, and each group had, had their uh, own hardships and assimilating. But the United States of America has always drawn its strength from the contributions of diverse people. Hispanics have contributed to every avenue of American life since the inception of this country. Hispanic culture not only helped mold America's early development, but also played an important role in helping to secure the birth of our new nation. The Hispanic legacy is not just in the names of our states and cities, but permeates so much so that Americans simply are unaware like, for example, that Montana and Colorado are Spanish words, too. We've talked a little bit about the U.S. service and U.S. military. Um, some 20,000 Hispanics fought in the Civil War. My sister mentioned that I, I'm a big fan of the Civil War historian. Some serving in the First Florida Cavalry, 
others serving in the Union forces in Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts. Some trace their ancestry to explorers who settled in North America generations ahead of the English. More than 18,000 Puerto Ricans served in the military during World War I. One soldier, Private Marcelino Serna, received two Purple Hearts for wounds received while capturing 24 German soldiers single-handedly. Serna became the first Latino soldier to receive the Distinguished Service Cross. Hispanics, as you are also probably aware, also galvanized social movements in the United States. Dr. Hector P. Garcia fought peacefully for the dismantling of segregation, segregation signs, racism, and discrimination in many Mexican-American communities in the Great Southwest in the 40s and 50s. He served as a role model for many Americans in creating the Mexican-American GI Forum in 1948, his appointment as United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Civil rights activists and labor leaders such as Cesar uh, Chavez, Dolores Huerta, coined the term, Si se puede, in 1972 during the farm workers' strike. Their efforts of uh, Hisp Hispanic empowerment and the use of grassroots organizing were transformative for American society, society generally and the labor movement specifically. So I'd like to transition now just a little bit uh, away from ruminating on what Hispanics have brought to the American table, and there's much to be proud of there. The remainder of my remarks today will focus on my work as a diplomat at the U.S. Department of State and Hispanics in U.S. diplomacy. As the Council General in Toronto, I'm privileged to represent the United States in the Council District of, of Ontario, which borders Buffalo, the great state of New York, Michigan, all the way out to Wisconsin and Minnesota. Toronto is now the fourth largest city in North America after Mexico City, New York, and L.A. The consulate general that I am privileged to lead is the largest of the seven consulates in Mission Canada, and the group of consuls and or foreign service officers I supervise is similar in size to that of a U.S. diplomatic mission or embassy in a medium-sized country. So many of you may wonder what a diplomat does. Uh, we all have a stereotypical image of a diplomat, perhaps a tall, usually white man in a tropical suit, meeting with other <laughs> diplomats in formal meeting rooms, negotiating for their governments and hammering out, out treaties related to war and peace. Another trope is the diplomat who spends a majority of his or her time at cocktail parties with other diplomats. <laughs> Strike pants. And actually, I actually do a fair amount of that. <laughs> But uh, it, it is, it's usually in the evening, it's, a, it's actually a lot of work. <laughs> but as a diplomat, I know that I have a clear mission, to carry out the foreign policy of the President of the United States and to represent the political and economic interests of the United States around the world. Diplomats do meet with foreign governments with which we have diplomatic relations to discuss bilateral issues between the United States and host countries, seeking cooperation that fosters greater trade opportunities and gains support in international arenas. But our interactions with representatives from other countries are only part of the picture. We have, first and foremost, and this is really the reason I have a consulate in, in, uh, in Toronto, why we have diplomatic missions around the world generally, because Congress funds these things, and our primary responsibility is to protect the lives and interests of American citizens abroad and to strengthen the security of the United States borders with the vigilant adjudication of visas and passports. And I've got a terrific team in, con in, in Toronto doing just that. We are the U.S. government's eyes and ears in a foreign country, developing relations that will allow us to achieve our policy goals. As one of the State Department's tools, Diplomacy 101, which is an interactive website on American diplomacy, explains, quote, the great, the great majority of diplomatic activity involves personal contact work, interacting and meeting with officials and citizens of a host country, getting to know them and their perspectives while representing the policies, values, and culture of the United States. Most of their work involves meeting with members and institutions of the business community, non-governmental organizations, and civil society, as well as the media, academia, and the artistic world to create links to common ideals and actions." End quote. And certainly that defines my work in my 30 years in the Foreign Service. When I was a young officer in Quito, I was the one that the embassy sent to talk to student organizations about their perspective on Ecuadorian national political developments. And I also traveled to about 19 of the 20 provinces in, in Quito during that president, or in Ecuador during that presidential election. As a result of my efforts, part of my efforts, we have had some officers doing stuff as well. We got the call right on what the elections were. We were within 5,000 votes of a you know, multi-million uh, vote election. In Karachi, Pakistan, I spoke with a with a rape victim uh, and worked to get in, in rural Sindh uh, province and worked to get her story told and to get needed social services 
in a culture and a time where that was very difficult. In Barcelona, I explained and defended to journalism students who were borderline hostile to U.S. policies. I still remember sweating that baby out, looking for the doorway, on, uh, on uh, issues such as the Iraq War or the death penalty in some U.S. states. In Toronto, I'm focused on working with provincial authorities, business, and indigenous groups to address access to potable water on First Nations reserves. Uh, when I first, I've been there, as I mentioned, about 10 months, uh, a couple months, three months into my, into my posting, I saw the Toronto Star had a story that said that in uh, northern Ontario, First Nations reserves, the, the equivalent of uh, uh, Native American reservations, do not have access to potable water. Some of them have been boiling water since 1995. I thought to myself, in this day and age, that's, that's something that's just not acceptable. So I've been working with provincial authorities, federal authorities, uh, uh, First Nations folks, and others, uh, you know, N uh, NGOs, and the business community to see how we can tr try to address that issue. So every day is different. Every day is interesting in furtherance of our national interest, which so often, but not always, coincide with those of our host country. The Department of State's mission is the same worldwide with an adaptation to each country's context and relationship. In short, that mission is, is to create a more secure, democratic, and prosperous world for the benefit of the American people and the international community. My consulate in our embassy in Ottawa, I said we have seven consulates spread out throughout, throughout Canada, is under the purview of the Department of State's Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. The Bureau's priorities throughout the region are fourfold. And first, to encourage accountable, transparent democratic governance, to protect citizens' safety, to expand economic opportunity and sustainable okay. economic development, and to ensure a clean and secure energy future for the citizens of our hemisphere. We have a compelling national security interest in the success of stable, secure, prosperous, democratic societies throughout the Americas, and an effective partnership with them in support of our highest global priorities. Those, fame, those four main pillars that I just mentioned in the Americas represent the keys to building those partnerships and capitalizing on those opportunities. It's remarkable to see how U.S. relations with the countries of the hemisphere are increasingly characterized by mature partnerships and shared values and interests. Certainly in our relationship with Canada, our closest neighbor and valued ally, we enjoy a partnership in which the opportunities far outnumber the challenges. The ties that we develop now will help shape our future success and prosperity and will have a multiplier effect throughout the hemisphere and around the world. President Obama's signature educational exchange initiative, 100,000 Strong in the Americas, is all about expanding those ties. The goal is to have 100,000 students from the United States studying elsewhere in the hemisphere, from Canada to Argentina, every year, and 100,000 students from the region studying in the United States every year. Universities in the, in the United States and other countries of the hemisphere, including Canada, are partnering to, uh, with the support of private sector donors to create more opportunities for international study. We'd certainly like to see more American students looking north to Canada and the first class, first class educational opportunities there, just as we encourage outstanding Canadian students to look to the United States for their higher education. And there's always that chance that international study will lead some of those talented young people to a career in foreign affairs. To become a diplomat, candidates go through the Foreign Service selection process, which is very rigorous, and includes separate written and oral exams, then security and medical clearances and suitability reviews. When the Foreign Service evaluates candidates, we assess for knowledge, intelligence, and skills like judgment, integrity, resourcefulness, resilience, and written communication and interpersonal skills. The Foreign Service is diverse, not only in ethnicity, race, age, and religion, but also academic and professional background. There are five professional areas for commissioned Foreign Service officers, Counselor, Economic, Management, Political, which is what I am, and Public Diplomacy work. There are also 19 professional areas for Foreign Service specialists, from diplomatic security agents to medical doctors, nurse practitioners like my beautiful wife Nancy, uh, to information technology managers. <coughs> Unfortunately, traditionally, Hispanics have been underrepresented within our Foreign Service. In 1961, Hispanics began to be recruited into the Department of State through the Latin America-focused Alliance for Progress started by President John F. Kennedy. Hispanics were hired through multiple avenues at the entry levels of the Foreign Service, through mid-career appointments, and via the assignment of talented non-career ambassadors. That said, 
we still have a very low number of Hispanic career foreign service officers moving to the top ranks of the Department of State. One exception was a mentor to me, Bob Manzanares, of Mexican-American background, but he has since retired. U.S. diplomacy has been aided over the years by White House appointments of a number of outstanding non-career Hispanic professionals to ambassadorial assignments. That would be among them Bill Richardson uh, to the United Nations, Edward Romero, Ambassador to Spain, and Esteban Torres to UNESCO. Our current Director General of the Foreign Service, and, and that position is re responsible for hiring and training of all of our diplomats, Arnold Chacon, has established a strong commitment to encouraging more people of Latino background to join the Foreign Service Corps. The current administration has also worked to increase the number of Hispanics in the federal workforce, which is now 17 percent of the total U.S. population, and to promote and create opportunities for advancement of Hispanics who are already in the federal workforce. The Department of State continues to work on increasing diversity and double hiring in the past 10 years for Hispanics and African Americans. Currently, Hispanics comprise about 7 percent of foreign service specialists and 5 percent of foreign service generalists and civil service employees. You can see that's pretty lagging behind the 17 percent of the total population. But the Bureau of Human Resources within the department also has <coughs> diplomats in residence sending out to college campuses throughout the United States to engage directly with the diverse student population, mentoring them, and encouraging them to consider a career in diplomacy. So after I speak today, I hope that you will encourage others within your communities to consider joining the Foreign Service or exploring other public service careers. If you are interested in the U.S. State Department, and I hope you will, I encourage you to look at careers.state.gov for more information on our requirements, testing, and different specialist and generalist career tracks. You can also look at our internship program that allows you to test drive this career. And I'd also like to highlight the Pickering and Wrangell scholarship programs that provide financial support for students of international affairs, place students in internships in Washington and overseas, and creates a pathway to become a foreign service officer. Members of minority groups, and particularly Hispanics, who have been historically underrepresented in the, United, in the Foreign Service, and those who have financial need are especially encouraged to apply. Okay, that was a lot of talking and information, and so I come full circle back to Buffalo, the city of my roots. Tammy tells me that la the Latino community here has come a long way in the 40 years since I left to find my own way, uh, but that there's still very much to do. Many of the issues are pioneers, like my mother and my father and those before them and some of them after. Those issues that they faced then are still prevalent today, if not as overtly. Poverty and crime are obstacles that hold this community back in many ways, and we need to continue to establish and make available educational and economic opportunities. The Department of State, like all of America, must acknowledge and respect the contributions of Hispanics and all ethnic minority groups in every aspect of our society. Our diversity, our history of immigration, these are the foundations of our country's economic, political, and social cultural power. And we have made some progress. I like to think that that progress is consistent with what is written in our Constitution, that we as Americans seek always to strive towards a more perfect union. Thank you. It's a pleasure to speak to you today. I'd like to invite the executive board of the council up. The executive board of the council. The executive board of the council. The executive officers, please. While they're making their uh, way up, Juan, we want to tell you that on behalf of our organization, and I'm sure of our community, we're very proud of you. You're a product of our community that makes us very proud, not only in our city, but our nation. A few years ago, one of the first interviews that was conducted with our history project was your parents' interview. There was a news reporter at that interview. They documented a lot of things, and they wrote a nice story that launched pretty much the oral interviews of our project. We took that newspaper article 
and we want to give it to you as a token of appreciation and thanks to you and your family for all you do. We hope that it hangs very well proudly on your office wall. It's, it's going up there today. Because we treasure it. Thank it's you. his mother, his father, our historian, Stephanie Buccolo. This interview was conducted at the High Point uh, Nursing Center and uh, is very prominent. And we cherish it and we hope you cherish it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am very proud to be here today. We have an announcement to make, and this has been very long in the making. You've heard some mention of it quite a bit this, this morning. Um, and this has been such a labor of love and a gigantic mountain of work, but it's been so worth it. And we hope that um, once I tell you a little bit about it, that you will take the time to go and take a look at the new archive yourself. Um, we hope you will be very proud of the effort that's gone into it. The Hispanic Heritage History Project began at the West Seneca Library in summer of 2012 with the first collecting of oral history interviews. Um, it was, the project was known then as the Bring Us Your History Project with the goal to collect and preserve the stories of Hispanics in Western New York. Along the way, and it's been a very long journey, there's been some struggles, there's been a lot to learn, um, but it's been a great adventure as well. Along the way, public historian Stephanie Buccolo has mentored the project with great devotion. Support has been achieved from m and Bank, New York State Council on the Arts, and the Arts Services Initiative. And the project was invited to become part of the Buffalo Neary County Public Library's Digitized Commons, a digital archive created through a significant federal grant. Since then, 50 oral history interviews have been conducted to directly capture and preserve important stories of individuals in their lives, families, and traditions. Also, a navigator team composed of many of you from the Hispanic Heritage Council met several times at the library to identify and select photos, documents, and other resources to go into the Hispanic Heritage History Project, and a first ever collecting day to identify new items for the archive was held this past March. Stephanie and digital librarian Allison Lund have collaborated over hundreds of hours in the past year to sort, categorize, select, describe, and index mountains of material for the archive. And this is only the beginning of a growing, ongoing project. Today, I'm happy to announce on behalf of the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library and our very valued partner, the Hispanic Heritage Council of Western New York, which, by the way, we are also happy to say, has recently established its first ever office in the downtown library, which is absolutely huge that you guys did that. that the Hispanic Heritage History Project is now available online, free to anyone, anywhere here in Western New York, here to anybody in this room, here to anybody in the world who cares to look at this material. This valuable resource can now be accessed through the HispanicHeritageWesternNewYork.org website, which is the HHC's website, or also through the library's website, which is www.buffalolib.org. Can you um, go on to uh, special collections? OK, go to digital collections. This is how you get on it from the library's website. On the purple navigation bar, you will see down under downtown central library, it will say special collections. From there, you get a little pop-up, and it says Digital Collections. And here on the left, the first one up is Community History Projects. That is where you find the archive. Click on that, would you? This is basically what it looks like. You can, you can scroll through all these different, there's different ways you can select different things. Um, explanation of the project as a whole. There is a Browse Collections. Uh, place you can click on where you can choose from the oral histories, 
Uh, you can also choose from photographs, um, and you can also choose from doc documents. So there's a variety of different materials that you can look at. Here you can today look at any of the hundreds of photos in the archive, some individual pictures and some in collection albums, or listen to any of the 41 oral history interviews currently online, content of each, which is also described. So if, if you clicked on any of the individual oral histories, you would get a description of what the person is talking about. And from there, you can decide if you want to listen to it or not. And then you can also click and listen to the audio of the person speaking. Everything on the site is bilingual English-Spanish. Um, and by the way, that's a first for the Buffalo New York County Public Library to have anything on its website that's bilingual. So that's great. As I said, this is only the beginning. More photos, documents, and interviews are waiting to be added, with more to be processed and selected for inclusion soon. As you look through the archive photos yourself, you may see a person, place, or occasion that you recognize that may not be fully identified. We are looking for more information on many of the photographs, such as dates, locations, or names of people, so let us know. If you have that information, we would love to collect it. Um, please let Kaz or Stephanie, who all of, I think all of you know, uh, know that information. We will add it to the website. This project has been very important for the library. The Hispanic Heritage Archive is now a working model of the importance of collecting and preserving the heritage and stories of various communities within the Buffalo and Western New York community. We greatly appreciate the ongoing warm partnership with Hispanic Heritage Council, and thank you to Kaz, who is practically living in my office these days, which is fine. <laughs> and we look forward to continuing a great collaboration that produces more projects like this one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ann. Um, I'd like for Kaz to come up, please. Uh, we would like to offer the Pioneer Awards. Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle. Let me get my glasses. As we all know, and many of us that are fully engaged in our community, we stand on the shoulders of the men and women that came before us. And we do not use this term loosely. We use it because we owe a debt of gratitude for their hard work and dedication to the community that they served. For many of us, it was a privilege to be able to walk with them, to work with them, to be part of their organizations, and to be in their midst as they led our community into the 21st century. There's not many of them around. But those that are around, we greatly appreciate. One of them is Juan Texidor. Yes. Juan was just recently honored at the, uh, the rededication of the Herman Badillo Bilingual Academy, where we honored the pioneers of bilingual education because Juan was part of that committee that led the effort to advocate for bilingual education in the Buffalo Public School. That's why if we go back in history, we can appreciate that that's why that school was called Herman Badillo. Because Badillo was a strong advocate in Congress back in those years, in the late 60s and the 70s, to get the funding to fund federal bilingual education programs across our country. <coughs> and we're living that today. 
Another pioneer that's not with us today is Pedro Mauras. Pedro did enormous for our community. He found many jobs for many of us and we owe a debt of gratitude to him because through his connections, many of us were able to raise our families. Pedro met a gentleman by the name of Jim Hudson at Erie Community College. And through that relationship, he was able to garner employment for many folks at the GM powertrain plant. I'm a product of that. And I'm forever grateful for that. And I know that many that were hired during that time are grateful for that. He's not here to receive his award because he was just released by uh, the hospital not too many days ago. I did visit him. He's in good spirits and we hope for his quick recovery. But a pioneer that is here that we owe a debt of gratitude that was one of the pioneers that put the first shovel in the Chicago and Swan area to build what today is the Pucho Olivencia Community Center. Another pioneer, the father of Chido Olivencia, that we owe a debt of gratitude to. And we honored at last year's Grease Pole Festival. But well, with us today is Rafael Rodriguez. Rafael, would you please come up? Would you please come up? Martha, bring your dad up. Rafael Rodriguez, uh, he lives in the state of Florida. He was one of the first that put the shovel in the in that uh, lot. And pictured here on this picture here is Agustino Levencia Sr., Rafael Rodriguez, Pedro Mauras, um, Juan Texidor, Benny Vasquez, and uh, another gentleman that his name does not come to mind, but the groundbreaking of the Puerto Rican American Community Association on Swan in Chicago back in 1969. We honor Rafael today for his many years of commitment and dedication to our community. Without your vision, Rafael, as you make your way up and the pride of our heritage, we wouldn't be where we're at today. To have and to share with our future generations. That's why I say very candidly and with all respect, we stand on the shoulders of these individuals. I'd like to present you this on behalf of Rafael, of our organization, the Hispanic Heritage Council, and our community. We love you. a few words in Spanish and uh, Esmeralda, please translate. Is she here? Buenos días. Bienvenidos todos a esta gran asamblea que tenemos aquí en esta mañana. Digo mañana porque todavía no voy a almorzar. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming and welcome to this great assembly. And I say good morning because to that it's still not lunch time yet. Mirando hacia allá donde están ustedes, veo mucha gente que en realidad hicieron mucho y están haciendo aún por este pueblo de Buffalo. Looking at you, I see many people that have done and still doing a lot of things for this, uh, for our people, for this community in Buffalo. Están frente a frente a mí. You are right in front of me. Personas que 
conocí en los 40 años que viví aquí en Buffalo. People that I met during the 40 years I've been here in Buffalo. Ahora, después de tantos años, 40 años. Now, after so long, 40 years. Ahora casi no puedo ni conmigo. Now I can only, <laughs> I, can, I can barely hold myself. Ya se dieron cuenta que, pues, bueno, muchos amigos que aún no me conocen, me ayudaron. As you can see, a lot of friends that if doesn't even know me, help me. Así que, ahora pues, naturalmente pues vivo en Florida, no por deseo de vivir allá, porque a mí me encanta la ciudad de Buffalo, donde estuve 40 años, pero el frío me acabó. <laughs> Obviously, I live in Florida, not because I don't like the city, but because the cold has killed me. <laughs> I was a little shabbier. I'm still a little shabby. Así que quiero llevar un saludo a todos ustedes, aquellos que me ayudaron o nos ayudaron a mí y al señor Olivencia. A Pedro Maura, a unos pocos más que no recuerdo, porque la mente ya se me está yendo también. I want to thank everyone and send greetings to all those that helped me and help others, like Pedro Maura, Mr. Olivencia, and many others that I can remember right now. Pero sí recuerdo bien a la familia Alsace. But I can really remember the Alsace family. No recuerdo a Juan porque sí recuerdo a Juan el padre, pero el hijo que está aquí presente que le, se dirigió a ustedes en esta mañana, no había tenido el, la, el placer de conocerlo, pero hoy me siento agradecido de haber escuchado sus palabras y toda su, su trayectoria donde en realidad no es fácil. I um, didn't I didn't met before Mr. Juan Alsace, but I met his father. I knew his father, and it's wonderful to have learned and heard about his history and the great trajectory and great job he's done, because it's not easy. Lleno de orgullo haber estrechado tu, tu mano en esta mañana. Estás al lado de tu querida madre, que tanto tiempo visité en ese lugar. I'm proud to meet you, to uh, hold your hand, and you are by your mother, who I met a long time. Sorry. Está muy bien. <laughs> <laughs> en este mundo podemos decir todo lo que querramos cuando escuchamos de los demás. Pero tenemos que perseverar. Así que tener mi amigo Juan, ¿dónde está? Se me fue ya. Oh, míralo allá. Tanto tiempo que tanto que luchamos. Y déjame decirles, señores que uno de mis amigos íntimos ha sido Juan Tecidor, que ya el tiempo también le puso el pelo blanco como a mí. Y él siempre decía que tenía un gallito, tú sabes que se queda un gallito en, la, en el pelo. Pues él lo cuidaba con mucho amor, pero ese gallito, ese gallito ya se le fue. Hi to Mr. Juan, also who's here, and they have struggled together for many, many years, which, like him, already had white hair. Um, but many, many years ago, he still wore the same hair, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, no quiero, quiero solamente llevar un saludo a todos ustedes nuevamente. Continúen con la lucha que se merece esta ciudad y el país entero para que podamos llevar, tener en mente para que estos tipos que están matando gente como los que pasó en Orlando, en San Bernardino, 
en Inglaterra, todos esos sitios puedan algún día recordar que hay un Dios arriba, que es el único que puede terminar con nuestras vidas. Él nos las dio, nos las ha de quitar algún día. Que el Señor les bendiga y continúen con esta gran obra que han comenzado. Que el Señor les acompañe y que pasen un buen día. Hasta luego. Again, greetings to everyone. Thank you for being here, for doing the work you do for the city, for the country, and the world. And we got to keep doing these things so we can avoid any future events like Bernardino, Orlando, and many other horrible attempts. And let's keep working for the city. God bless you, and God bless you always, because God is the only one that gives us the life, and he's the only one that has the right to take it. Amen, and God bless you again. It is our honor as an organization to welcome three new directors to our organization. Amy Casilla Osorio. Andreas D. Ortiz, Esquire. Nancy S. Fernandez. I am sure that uh, our secretary, Dr. Asase, has uh, sent you the bylaws and the package, and uh, they're ready to work according to uh, their wishes. Thank you very much, and welcome to the board. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends of the Hispanic Heritage Council, first of all, I'd like to thank the program committee for this fantastic job. Didn't they do a fantastic job? <laughs> Michelle, thank you very much. Adi Tyler, thank you very much. Took care of our video. To the entire program committee, Eileen Gonzalez Marti, which is not here, Nancy Fernandez, Esmeralda Sierra, thank you very much. Dinora Santos, the mother. Dinora Santos, the daughter. Maritza Vega, our VP. Dr. Asase, Amy Casillas, new board members started. Uh, the ground running, Maria Rosario Cava, and Samantha Gonzalez. That's the team that put this venue together, of which we're very much appreciative and thankful. Thank you very much. For all the directors, uh, before you leave, if you go behind the screen, there's a little token of appreciation there for you. Just look for your name and take it home. <laughs> And for those volunteers that help, there's also a token of appreciation for you, but yours is in gold, okay? Because you are a special as well. We are humbled this afternoon uh, for your support. That goes to everyone that's still here and those that left. On behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you for the trust you have laid upon each and every one of us as directors of this organization to lead our mission. I'd like to say that our organization takes its mission very seriously. Each director takes the mission, the vision, the core values of this organization very seriously. Because we have been called to serve a community that is proud of its roots. I could not be more prouder to serve alongside each and every one of the directors of this organization, and I really mean that. 
you like to meet them, they're part of the, their names are part of the booklet, but if you go on our website, there's a little bio on them. And I could not be more prouder to serve with these folks that are very dedicated. They have the passion to lead this organization, to lead its mission to the community. Every day, these individuals that make up this organization and the volunteers are servants that day after day dedicate their time to fulfill the dreams of our forefathers. We are a board made of volunteers. Like I said, we are people of high standard, integrity. We are serious about community, progress, and its future. Anything short of that is not on our agenda. I invite you to visit our webpage, read our vision, read our mission, our core values. Each and every one of us are sworn to uphold these principles to make sure that daily we live by and stand by them. I'm proud to represent this organization and every director on this board is proud to serve this organization to serve this community. Thank you very much. God bless you. Enjoy your weekend. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.